Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where Scarlett Johansson got a very nice headline yesterday, courtesy of Box Office Mojo, which announced that she is the highest grossing actress of all time. Uh, there are a couple of other nice uh, records that she broke there, which we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, but first, let's just get to the heart of the matter, and that's that some people are saying, well, that's only because she's riding Marvel's coattails. Uh, and we're going to discuss as to whether or not that's true. Is Scarlett Johansson only the highest grossing actress of all time because she's lucky enough to be a Black Widow? And let's not forget that she wasn't even the first choice for the role. John Favreau had wanted Emily Blunt, but Blunt was infamously already committed to Gulliver's Travels. Ooh, Hollywood. But then, you know, Doug Gray Scott was supposed to be Wolverine, couldn't get out of his Mission Impossible commitment, and that turned out just great, not only for Hugh Jackman, but for audiences and Fox and the X-Men franchise. So sometimes, even if they're not the first choice, the right person ends up getting the job. And Scarlett Johansson has done a very good job as Black Widow. Not only does she really commit to the role, but she's worked very hard, at least in the past, to promote the movie. She was absent for most of the promotion for Captain America, America Civil War with Elizabeth Olsen stepping in uh, and of course she had Ghost in the Shell as an excuse saying oh, I'm making this other movie but if I had to guess I would say you know it's very often that especially for a big movie like Captain America Civil War an actor will schedule in time off from their current project to promote the new project that's actually hitting theaters and usually the the production that they're filming doesn't mind because they want the current film to be successful so that you continue to you know be a box office commodity and help the film that you're shooting when it hits theaters and also if you happen to be occupied with another film you will take time off to promote this new movie right so uh it's it's, it's it could have been done if Scarlett Johansson wanted it to be I think she's tired of helping out Marvel uh and being uh, strictly supporting because she really wants a Black Widow movie she's been saying she wanted a Black Widow movie since day one and even after Lucy she still hasn't gotten one and you know supporters of a Black Widow movie feel that maybe this latest headline will help her and I will say that I think that Scarlett Johansson has become a big part of what people like about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, and since Marvel, you know, has created this star, and I think they do deserve a lot of the credit, I don't understand why they wouldn't want to reap the benefits. You could make a pretty low-budget Black Widow movie uh, that I think would do quite well, especially because while most of the movies that have given her this title are from Marvel, Lucy did very, very well from Luc Besson, and that was all Scarlett Johansson. Uh, I also wanted to point out some numbers here. I, I have said sometimes in the past that uh, you know, a, lum a number of people went to see Captain America Civil War for, for Scarlett Johansson. And a number of anti-Black Widow people have said, that's ridiculous, you're just making that up. So I pulled up the numbers here. This is from Deadline, uh, one of the top industry trades. And I'll put a link to this article in the video description so that you can see it for yourself. But uh, a couple ways down the article, just search for Scarlett uh, uh, with two T's and you'll get, you'll find the blurb. But CinemaScore polled people as to why they came out to see the, Mar to the Marvel movie. And 64% people came because it was a Marvel movie, uh, showing tremendous brand loyalty that Pixar also enjoys. 54% uh, because it was a superhero title. 39% cited either Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Evans, but then 24% said they came for Scarlett Johansson. So she does get on the board and she does bring people in. So I think that, that therefore she deserves uh, some credit for the box office success of the Marvel movies that she participates in. And she was a very big part of what made Winter Soldier so good. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, but I have to say, though, she's not quite at the same level as uh, Doris Day and Betty Davis, two of the biggest grossing actresses of their time periods, who were usually the stars of their movies. Uh, but anyway, we're in, uh, we're in the, the uh, we're in the superhero blockbuster uh, era of movie making. Uh, and we got, you know, I think it's really just so far you just have uh, Jennifer Lawrence's Katniss. So anyway, the other things that she broke on this box office mojo list, uh, she is the youngest person in the top 30, male or female. Uh, she is the only woman in the top 10. Uh, Cameron Diaz is in the top 20. Uh, and then also I think what's notable is that she is paid on par with her male peers at this point. Uh, I think because of Lucy. I think Lucy proved that she could bring in an audience on her own. That movie made over 400 million worldwide. That's very, very impressive. And I also think we'll see how Ghost in the Shell does. Uh, there's a, uh, the producer is trying to, you know, do a little bit of damage control after the whole whitewashing controversy. And he said, well, you know, we're taking the international approach. This is a global story. And we do have a number of uh, Asian actors from, you know, different Asian countries 
countries uh, in the movie. I hope they have large roles. Uh, I think if they can truly make this feel international, like The Martian, uh, and that you know that they have an Asian actor in a major role, not just like you know uh, peppering the background. I think that you know maybe they'll be able to get away with it. And if Scarlett Johansson does a really good job, we'll see, we'll see. But I think it's a it's certainly a very interesting story. Now, talking about movies that had maybe a little bit of a bad a bad buzz but recovered, the second story of the day is about Pacific Rim 2, which is coming together quite nicely. So the, the big reason Pacific Rim 2 is that we have two headlines for Pacific Rim 2. First is that a release date has been set, a new release date, and then also that Scott Eastwood is in talks to join. So let's start out with that release date. It's now been set. Its original release date was April 7th, 2017. But then Universal and Legendary got into a big fight, um, and Universal, to you know fight back, uh, took Pacific Rim 2 off of their release schedule, which was really bad. But it looks like they've made up because they've put it back on, and its new release date is February 23rd, 2018, which is basically the Deadpool Kingsman date, right? I mean, it's not it's not Valentine's Day, but still, it's right around there, and February has become a very good month for, uh, you know, out-of-the-box superhero or blockbuster films. It's kind of becoming like another August, right? August is when you saw Guardians of the Galaxy debut. It's when Suicide Squad is coming out. And of course, February saw Deadpool and Kingsman. Uh, and all have uh, launched franchises. So maybe it can help the Pacific Rim franchise. So I think the movie also, it has a great director, Stephen S. DeKnight from not only Spartacus, but season one of Daredevil will be making his feature film debut. John Boyega, of course, now is famously attached to Star as the son of Idris Elba's character. Uh, and he's also going to produce, which is very impressive. And now also Scott Eastwood is looking to join. And while that uh, a couple of you know years ago, or even a couple of months ago, would have not seemed like a good development, Scott Eastwood looks like he might be uh, succeeding where his sister Allison Eastwood has not, and that is actually building a successful movie career. I don't know how why he clicked, because I have not been particularly impressed with anything Scott Eastwood has done to date. Uh, but he must have a wonderful management team. Or maybe he's very good in, you know, Suicide Squad, and that's, you know, or maybe just his participation in Suicide Squad. But still, I'd be like, well, why not Joel Kinnaman then? But anyway, Scott Eastwood, of course, will be appearing in Suicide Squad. Many believe him to be Nightwing. I don't think that he is, but we'll see. Uh, and then also, of course, he's in Fast 8, you know, uh, the upcoming Fast and Furious installment with Charlize Theron joining, uh, Tormund from Game of Thrones, and then, of course, Vin Diesel, Dwayne Johnson, and a, and a really, you know, stellar cast. So uh, Pacific Rim 2 is shaping up, you know, very nicely. And I also think Guillermo del Toro... I think it might benefit the movie that he's not actually directing. I think that Guillermo del Toro can sometimes get distracted by his production design, which I said was the problem with Crimson Peak. Uh, and I think that he's not, perhaps, you know, he did a good job with the Hellboy films, uh, but perhaps he's just not mainstream enough to produce the kind of movie that Pacific Rim, a Pacific Rim movie needs to be. So we'll see how Stephen S. DeKnight does. I have a lot of faith in him based on Daredevil season one. Now, speaking of Suicide Squad, the third story of the day is that that is the most buzzed about movie on social media. Uh, and everyone's making a big deal about the fact that it came in before Rogue One. Uh, it topped it on the list. However, I would say it's a little early for Rogue One. Uh, I think that Rogue One is going to become a bigger deal, you know, closer to the release date. Also, it might be another female lead. I think that, you know, Disney might come to regret that decision. You know, they have to make sure that they diversify the Star Wars movies uh, in a, in a way that makes them seem very different. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with Rogue One. But what's interesting to me about Suicide Squad, and the reason I wanted to cover the story today, it came out like a few days ago, but I was walking to work this morning, and I saw uh, this guy, like maybe in his 50s, uh, walking along the street, and he didn't seem like the target audience for Suicide Squad, but he was wearing a Suicide Squad t-shirt. And I was like, hmm, really? So I thought that was very exciting. So I think Suicide Squad could indeed be something special. Maybe the guy worked on the movie, I don't know. It looked maybe like a, a shirt from the set because uh, it was just a black shirt with the red Suicide Squad, the logo for Suicide Squad in red. So I wasn't sure, like just the words, but I thought it was neat that he was wearing it. But anyway, uh, Suicide Squad is topping the buzz for Star Trek Beyond and Ghostbusters, two movies that come out, of course, before Suicide Squad. Uh, I think that's more of a case that they just didn't do a very good job programming the summer. I, I think Jason Bourne will be a big hit. But I think that the summer, for some reason, uh, the middle of it just, the, the middle of the middle of summer just fell away, right? It just crumbled. I don't know what's going on, uh, but I think Suicide Squad is probably the next big blockbuster to hit. Uh, well, everybody knew Finding Dory would be big. Maybe Secret Life of Pets will also be big. We'll see. Uh, but it's been 
a surprisingly uh, slow summer, which had not been anticipated. Let's hope that Comic-Con can really liven things up. But Warner Brothers is actually, uh, you know, doing a really good job. They're powering that buzz with new posters and then also that music video that a number of you uh, tweeted me about, which features some new footage. So they're being very smart. And they're also doing a good job with Fantastic Beasts, which, which came in third for the buzz for the week. So yay, Warner Brothers! That's great. And uh, I think it couldn't happen to two nicer movies, uh, Suicide Squad and Fantastic Beasts. And two very crucial movies for Warner Brothers because, of course, they need the DC franchise and the Harry Potter franchise to really... Uh, power their um, to power their slate. All right, so those are the three news stories of the day. And as for the viewer question, this is a follow up to my Miles Morales uh, theory video yesterday, because uh, I want to clarify something. And Marty Sandoval has a really good question to do that. So Marty says, "Grace, I got a question. I don't read any comics, so forgive me for not knowing anything about Spider Man other than what I see in the movies." Smiley face. So if Miles Morales is going to be introduced, does this mean that Tom Holland's Spider Man is going to be short lived? Or will they have a spin-off Spider-Man series like you suggested? Also, if people are getting people are getting a little Spider-Man fatigue, wouldn't having two different Spider-Man stories going on around the same time be a little too much? It would suck for Tom Holland, wouldn't it? He just started this awesome role, and they're already putting in a younger Spider-Man in his movie. Just my thoughts. What do you think, Grace? Well, I think that people have to remember that just because Miles Morales was originally introduced with the death of Peter Parker in the Ultimate line, it does not mean that uh, Peter Parker needs to die to see him introduced in the MCU. Uh, particularly because Peter Parker and Miles Morales now coexist in the 616, the main, line, the main continuity of Marvel Comics. So, as I said in my uh, theory video, and if you'd like to check it out, uh, please do. It's over on the main Beyond the Trailer channel. I'll put a link to it in the video description as well. Uh, but I think that they could even just introduce Miles Morales as a character and not have him, uh, you know, get his Spider-Man powers until another movie. Or, as one of you suggested, I think very cleverly, they could do it as an end credit sequence, that he gets bitten by a spider. Uh, so I, that's what I think is uh, likely going to happen. I think they're just introducing Miles Morales and they're planting the seeds. Now, I think there is Spider-Man fatigue, and I think that Peter Parker, there's been a lot of Peter Parker movies in very quick succession. So I think if you brought in Miles Morales, uh, you know, along with a very diverse cast, which is, which is what they've done, that would be a way to make it seem a little bit different. Because, you know, I agree with many people that if they were going to go back to Peter Parker, I would have done an adult Peter Parker. You know, to continually have him in school is tough. I know there are a lot of Spider-Man fans who are powering this, uh, but I think what you really have to be concerned about is, you know, the larger audience that isn't on the internet, that isn't into comics. Do they want to watch yet another Spider-Man movie? And so I think bringing in Miles Morales is a way to make it, I think, a little bit more interesting. As for Tom Holland's Spider-Man, I think that he can continue to be Spider-Man. You know, you have to remember that Sony wants a whole Spider-Verse of movies, so they need to start... You know, just like Civil War introduced characters that will get their own films and be spun off, I think there's no reason to think that wouldn't happen in Spider-Man Homecoming. They want to introduce characters that would then, therefore, get their own films uh, as a spin-off from Spider-Man Homecoming. But that would still be part of the MCU, interestingly enough. Ah, the MCU growing at an incredible rate. An alarming rate to the other studios. But I think Tom Holland would be fine, and I think that Tom Holland, you know, should welcome this because he just wants to make sure that this seems very different from the Spider-Man movies that have come before, particularly the Andrew Garfield ones that were just wrapped and are very fresh in everyone's mind. And also, if you have kind of like a Miles Morales origin story, or you kind of hint at that, it gives you the excitement of an origin story without having to do a Peter Parker one yet again. So we'll see. I think I'm glad that everyone's so protective of Tom Holland's Spider-Man, but I wouldn't assume that Tom Holland's Spider-Man is going to be such a slam dunk. I mean, we'll see. I thought he was great in the role, but I do think there is a little bit of Spider-Man fatigue still, uh, and for his own movie, I think they want to make sure that there's a lot happening there. If it's just another Peter Parker story, I think that that would be a tough sell to many. So if you can say, hey, there's so much new and exciting stuff happening to Peter Parker, you have to come see this, uh, that's an easier sell. So, don't think that Miles Morales means anything negative for Tom Holland's Peter Parker, or a hopefully Abraham Atta's Miles Morales. I, I think it's good for everyone. All right, so I hope that answers your question, Marty. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Please write down below think of today's top three stories and Marty's uh, viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered Tuesday and any questions that you might have. Yes, Monday is the 4th of July here in the United States, and uh, so programming will return, including Movie Math, on the Tuesday. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.